All right, thank you, Faye. And I'm one of those that, I, this is the second time I've been in this building, which is sad to admit, but it's wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm Chris McGilvery, Chair of our Downtown Development Board of Directors, and we're always looking for opportunities to engage with you all, engage in the community, to have targeted, thoughtful conversations about how we can be better, um, better as a downtown as we progress forward. And as part of our Building Better uh, Cities series, we've invited leaders from across the front range representing Greeley, Loveland, and Fort Collins this evening to have a discussion on ways that, uh, based on their experiences, uh, ways that they've built a strong, vibrant downtown where uh, people live, play, have fun. Um, they're going to talk about some of the challenges that they faced um, in their roles as directors uh, around just all the challenges that come with growth, right? Um, how do we grow our communities while maintaining the character of our communities and our identities of who we are as a city? And so um, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to um, have an awesome conversation and you all will be welcome to participate in that discussion. Um, and so without further ado, I want to thank you all for coming. I'm excited about this. Thank you for our guests for taking the time out of their busy schedules to participate in this discussion. And I want to introduce Kimberly McGee, our Executive Director of the Longmont Downtown Development. Thank you all so much. I have the honor of moderating this panel today, and I have had the honor of working with these fine, wonderful, intelligent people um, since I have uh, gotten here. So super glad to have them, and super glad to have all of you here. Um, I know Chris talked a little bit about the challenges, but I think we're going to talk about the triumphs and the things that happen and, and the things that, that we've done. So I have a few questions that I'm going to moderate with the panel, and then we can open it up to questions for you. Um, so if you want to turn to the next slide, I'm going to start with Bianca. Bianca, if you could please uh, introduce yourself, that'd be great. Absolutely. Are you ready for me to just run through? Kimberly, fantastic. Yep. Um, would, would you guys like me to stand or am I okay sitting? Can everyone? Okay, great. I'm going to opt for the cozy chair then. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Bianca Fisher. I am the executive director of the Greeley Downtown Development Authority. Our DDA was established in 1998. Um, City Council didn't actually approve our plan of development until 2002. So kind of 2003 is, is the year we consider our base year. But um, I have been with the DDA for the past 14 years, um, served as the executive director for about the last four and a half, and associate director before that, project coordinator and administrative assistant, literally every role in our little organization. So it's been great to kind of touch and be a part of um, every piece of our organization. But um, our district um, in downtown Greeley is about 55 blocks. Um, we extend to the south. We actually touch UNC's campus at about 17th Street, and then we go to the north to about 5th Street. So a pretty large area. Um, we do have two historic districts within our downtown. Um, we have an enterprise zone. We also have an opportunity zone, and then we are a part of the larger Greeley Creative District. Um, in our district, we have a lot of great public amenities like um, Lincoln Park, which is right in the middle of our core downtown. We have a great civic center. We have a recreation center, a senior center, um, an ice house, so a lot of great public amenities. Um, our library district um, is currently building a brand new library and innovation center in the old Greeley Tribune building, so a lot of great um, public spaces. We also are really close to, like I mentioned, UNC. We're close to the Poudre River Trail Corridor um, and also the Greeley Weld Airport. So a lot of close amenities in our district. Um, as far as our business mix, we have about 300 street level businesses, um, a really wide mix um, of businesses. Um, so yeah, and then in 2011, a kind of a fun fact about our district is we were the first in the state of Colorado to take advantage um, of the common consumption legislation, which um, 
we really were able to activate a Friday Fest event, which is our um, outdoor live free uh, music series. Um, and starts in the middle of May and goes all the way through middle of September. Um, we have thousands of folks that come out every Friday night to enjoy live music um, in the Go Cup. So um, I don't know if you want me to keep going, Kimberly, or I can, okay, wonderful. I think that's great. Um, so next slide and we'll turn it over to Matt. I'm so, yeah, to Matt. Good evening, thanks for uh, having us tonight. Uh, my name is Matt Robinald, I'm the Exec Director of the Fort Collins Downtown Development Authority. Um, one of the questions is my past work experience. Um, I've been in Colorado now for almost a quarter century um, and uh, my work here has been entirely in the public financing realm. Um, prior to uh, Fort Collins DDA, I was with the city of Loveland and established their Urban Renewal Authority. Um, and uh, uh, before that I was in, uh, I've been in redevelopment my entire career um, in Knoxville, Tennessee as a, a downtown business owner um, at a brew pub and restaurant. And then in Michigan, um, an environmental remediation firm that uh, focused on brownfield redevelopment. Um, Fort Collins uh, downtown um, is, I would describe its character as, it's our, our historic commercial core, it's our historic industrial zoned areas, which today comprises a lot of our uh, craft brewing, um, large craft brewers, and, um, um, and, and um, also our, our entertainment district, where it's the center of government, as well as uh, we have three museums. Um, so it, it's, it's um, uh, culture, um, uh, living, downtown living, and, and uh, shopping and entertainment. Um, we've been around since 1981, so just a year or two older than Longmont DDA. And, um, um, we have um, um, had struggles recently with regard to um, the live, work, play uh, uh, trifecta. It's becoming harder and harder to live in Fort Collins because of rising housing costs, which I'm sure you don't escape that uh, issue here in Longmont either. Um, but we've taken some steps to <clears throat> really direct some of our resources as a DDA into addressing that issue with uh, workforce housing for, for downtown employees. And um, why we do that? Um, because downtowns are important. Um, you know, downtowns are the soul of, of a community and they represent uh, the past, the present, and if you're doing it right, you're also looking forward to the future because downtowns don't ever stop evolving and you've got to embrace all of that if you're going to do, do it well. Thank you so much. Um, next slide and Sean. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Hawkins. I run the DDA, the Loveland, and also the Loveland Downtown Partnership in Loveland, and I've done that now for about four and a half years. And Loveland is much newer to this game than our all of our neighbors here. We formed a DDA in 2017. So in advance of that DDA, um, Loveland had a 15-year period. Uh, it sounds like a Great Depression where from 2002 to 2017, it took 15 years to get that sales tax level back to 2002. So it had a very, very long, tough period there. Um, but for me, that leaves a, a lot of opportunity. So I, I've always worked in, in small towns. I, I started doing this in, in downtown Missoula, uh, Montana, where I went to school. Uh, great downtown. I think it's actually one of the best small downtowns in the country today. I worked in a little, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, so I worked in a little town called Cordon, Indiana for about seven years. And then I did a little bit of consulting work um, for a company called Urban Place Consulting based out of uh, Long Beach, California before I landed in Yakima, Washington for about 12 years. So uh, I've always worked in these small towns. It's real special to me to get to integrate and be have a, a, a really my boots on the ground type of approach. I'm very hands-on in doing this. And uh, there's a wonderful opportunity in, in Loveland. And one of the things is, is so many of the old buildings have just have not been touched. No bank would loan on them with lower rents. It's hard to make them pencil. So now having a DDA, that also has sales tax. Most of our fellow DDAs get the property tax. We also get the sales tax. And so we're finding a way to make these older buildings pencil. And I think downtown is really important in Loveland 
My perspective of being fairly new to northern Colorado is it's pretty homogenous. Lots, lots of things that kind of look the same, or it could look like it could be some of these neighborhoods could be in Cleveland, Ohio, or some other place. But our downtown is really special, and it's not only just the buildings, it's also the people and the stories and the memories, and so we try to hold that very closely as we do our work. We are challenged because we don't have that many people that work in our downtown. We don't have any big office. Um, Larimer County had a, a facility that moved out of town a, a handful of years ago. The city hall in Loveland is it's four or five blocks from the heart of downtown, which is enough to make people maybe get in their car sometimes to go out to lunch instead of walking to downtown. So we are challenged with workers, but we also have a number of new residential projects. And so I, I really like that part. It is the building of a neighborhood and making people feel comfortable and safe. But that also means that the lunchtime can be pretty quiet at some times, especially this time of year when we don't get all the Rocky Mountain National Park tourists coming through it. So, um, but it's important. I really take our work very seriously. We are getting ready to redo 4th Street. If you would drive down 4th Street today, it might look like one of these mountain roads um, that you're going down. It's very rough. There's many potholes. Uh, and we're getting ready to do all five blocks of it. And to do that is literally the city's main street. We have to take it very, um, very serious so we get it right. So it's, it's a fun, fun opportunity. I'm very, very lucky to be where I am today. So thank you. Awesome. So just to let all of you know, if anyone is new to DDAs, they're downtown development authorities. They're meant to be in the heart of your downtown in your central business district, and they're meant to make sure that you're preserving that character that you're promoting and that you're growing the core of your town. Uh, we like to say that downtown is everyone's neighborhood, although now we're expanding into having neighbors of our own, and it is a neighborhood of those who live there. When we talk about the live, work, and play triangle, those are the three things that we really need to keep balanced and, and, and keep moving to have people coming and engaging our downtown day, evening, um, and then sleeping here at night. Uh, for our downtown um, here in Longmont, we have, um, I just did a presentation this morning to our business owners, and we have a little over 1,600 residents. And so that's probably kind of a smaller neighborhood, but we are seeing people that are starting to live here, um, which is a wonderful way to kind of engage, as we today in our industry, um, rooftops bring retail. And so it really supports those storefront businesses that everyone wants, that makes the character of your downtown, that makes people wanting to, to be here. But I always say it is the hardest business and these folks put everything that they have in it, their hearts, their money, everything into making these work. So the more that we can get those supported, the more that we can continue to get the things that we want. So it's really wonderful. Um, I think we all look at our jobs as managers of place. And so this sense of place that you feel when you're here goes well beyond what the buildings look like or well beyond what's going on inside of them. It is the character, it is all of that. Um, so one of the things that we often cite is that historic nature of our downtowns and people often take great pride in that. Um, as we're maintaining that, I would just like to ask each of you how you maintain the character or the authenticity while you're investing in the future. So I'm going to start with Sean. Um, and if you, next slide, that'd be great. The slides, by the way, are just giving you a feel of the downtowns. They may not necessarily equate with what they're saying, but just so you can kind of see the downtown. So. What I really think about it being newer to our community was really just doing a lot of listening. And I wanted to get a sense of you know, how people, what the memories were, how pe what type of events people attended in the past. And there weren't many historic preservation success stories in Loveland. We're, we are going to change that. We are probably working on a dozen older buildings right now. And, and so I wanted to do a lot of listening. And unfortunately, a lot of things have been torn down. You start hearing these stories of what was there, what was there, what was there. So we, we, have, we recognize that we have to save what we can, but also make new development as compatible as possible too. Lo Loveland, unfortunately, I don't know if your community is this way, but a lot of the brick work done in the 30s and 40s the, must, is very poor quality. So to preserve a lot of that old brick is really hard. So we're trying to find ways to bring new brick into older buildings. And that is, a, that is an option to us. So an example right now that we're working on is our Elks building. The Elks building is about 30,000 square feet. It is, was the hotel when people came to the National Park back in the early 1900s because it's right across from the depot. It's in horrible shape. It literally would never, ever pencil 
Uh, and one of the reasons we're putting, we'll put it probably two and a half million dollars to get this done, is that um, is the stories people have. The Elks had 2,500 members back in the 80s, so it was the social hub of the community. And so we're trying to really honor that. I really believe, and we're putting a rooftop deck on it. They didn't have a rooftop deck on it, but we found a way to do it that the National Park Service, who owns the easement on the facade, they, they're comfortable with it too. So we're trying to modernize it into new uses that people will really respond with. And then another project is happening is our old feed and, feed and grain project. The, the state of Colorado is putting $5 million into this. I'm actually very surprised that this building hasn't burned down, given the, the amount of wood in it. Um, these large wood beams. But what's interesting is the community is like, sure, this is great, but there isn't the celebration that's going to be with working on the Elks. And it's because no one has memories of the feeding grain. They didn't go there. There was no reason. They didn't have these, you know, celebrate community celebrations. And so we're really trying to honor that past with this with special buildings. We don't have a lot of newer buildings popping up just yet. I mean, the, the whole foundry complex, if you've seen that once you hit First Street, is newer. Um, but we're trying to make it blend in the best we can. So we just try to listen a lot. And because of that, uh, I think everything is very peaceful. We have a lot of wind in our sails, and, and that's very enjoyable for me to be, live, to be working in a very peaceful uh, community conversation where people are, are, are saying, we like what's happening. So. And next slide. In our downtown, like I mentioned, we have two historic districts, and so, you know, a, a big um, impetus of those districts is really preserving. It's the same is true in our community as we're sitting in this theater. I was thinking about all of the pictures of our old chief theater that, I mean, people absolutely lament um, its um, destruction and old um, post office, all of these beautiful um, you know, memories of the past. So our historic preservation um, office through the city of Greeley is very active in preserving um, the historic structures. But another great example is 8th Avenue, which is the main corridor into our downtown, into the city itself, and into the university. Um, the city actually commissioned a study to, to figure out which buildings are historically significant. They may not be on the register, and it is not a district, but we still wanted to recognize the buildings, like Sean was talking about, that have these significance, that whether it's memories or in its use. Um, and what's great about that is um, a great example is we had a developer that came and purchased, it was the old, we call it the Garnsey, um, Garnsey building, but it was an old Ford building where they actually used to build Model Ts um, in the basement and drive them out of this building. It was like Fort Knox, there's so much concrete in that building. Um, it wasn't on the historic register, um, and, and really it wasn't incredibly beautiful except for this red brick facade. And what was really fantastic is the developers really honored um, this historic building, and so they actually had a mason that brick by brick took down that facade. It was the most, it was a very slow process, but incredibly beautiful to see, and so now you have this very modern, it's a 55 resort apartments, so it's 84 uh, residential units for the 55 and older crowd. But they've got the, this historic red brick from the original building, and you actually see the Ford uh, logo, the original Ford, and, and now that's the entrance into our new Austin's restaurant. Um, and so it's a really um, beautiful way that they honored the past um, without having to do it because they were a historic registered property. The other thing I will say is that we have to figure out ways to support these projects. Like Sean said, it doesn't make sense on paper. No developer is going to willingly come and, and want to, you know, maintain or restore that historic character. So we have a variety of, there's historic tax credits, um, you know, just different opportunities through our TIF that we can support um, projects with our facade grants, our building improvement grants. Um, the city has um, a couple loan programs as well, so really looking at ways that we can help fill that gap because it's incredibly costly but incredibly important. And then lastly, I would just say is, you know, from an architectural standpoint, I laugh. Uh, sometimes in our district we have uh, periods of time in architecture that I don't think uh, we're, we're so well well preserving. Uh, we've got a building that's entirely concrete. I mean, it's literally just a concrete behemoth. 
Um, you know, but it represented a moment in time in history. Um, and so I think just figuring out ways to tell, tell that story and let it be a part of the fabric and, and landscape really honors your history, your culture, and your story. So, Great, thanks. And Matt, next, next slide, please. So in Fort Collins, the way we maintain character and still recognize the need to invest in the future, um, you know, Sean said it really well that it's the people and the businesses that really make up, make a downtown vibrant. And so paying attention to uh, the health and well-being of the business community is, is very important. But from a physical standpoint, um, the way that we address this in Fort Collins is um, certainly investment in the rehabilitation of, of historic buildings. Um, our organization has probably partnered with 90% of the, the historic buildings in our core. Uh, the building owners to, to help rehab those those buildings over the years. Um, so following Secretary of Interior standards and and, and so forth are, are really important when when a t when tackling those those uh, types of projects. We also pay really close attention um, not just to the vertical architecture but the horizontal architecture in our downtown when it comes to conveying our history. We've taken great effort to, to pay attention to fine grain details like um, coal chutes for old buildings. We, we maintain those in the sidewalk. So we, we've got a couple of blocks where those have uh, been preserved and, and are part of the, the new sidewalks. Um, light wells um, uh, for historic buildings. Um, those are what used to let light into the basements of, of buildings. We've painstakingly made, paid attention to keeping those intact when we do horizontal um, improvements. Um, and then also uh, Fort Collins, is, we have um, an old municipal railway, uh, streetcars, and we've got uh, several blocks of our downtown that have, uh, we've preserved the, the trolley tracks. So it's it, it, that and, and also segments of historic sandstone sidewalk and, and everything. So those are just some of the, the punctuation marks of fine grain details that we pay attention to as a way to keep our connection to the past but one of the one of the other ways that we do that is recognizing the different eras of of construction and our downtown um, we view ourselves as having two main streets us uh, highway 287 which is college avenue but also mountain avenue which is an east west street and when you stand at the intersection of the, those two streets there there are four buildings on each of the corners and each of them is separated um, by about 30 to 40 years uh, in time span. Total of 70 years separates all of them. We've got a mid-century uh, 60s era bank building on one corner, a 19, late 1920s era um, uh, bank building on the other corner, a 1910 era um, old Woolworths commercial block building, and a 1890s Richardsonian building. And we geek out about architecture in Fort Collins to the point where um, we, 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 we made the community, and, and whether it was the city planners or um, decision makers, we made them have to become um, geeks about architecture to understand that when we're designing for the future, we're open to contemporary design because we were getting stuck in a rut where, where our community was, we were approving buildings, and we've got some bad examples in our downtown where an effort to make a building that's being constructed in the, you know, in 2015, 2016, making it look like something that was from the turn of the 20th century, um, and we were for we we were coming up with some things that look like fake historic architecture, so we we worked with the city to develop new design standards for the downtown that recognize contemporary architecture has its place. It's not so much about paying attention to the style. Um, it's about paying more attention to the typology of buildings, recognizing that a commercial building in an urban setting has certain certain features to it, and it doesn't matter what how you dress it in style, but it has certain elements that make it work in a in an urban context, and engage the the street and the sidewalk. So those are the ways that we uh, that we pay attention to the past, but recognize we've got to look towards the future, and create those historic landmarks built today for the next 75, 100 years. 
Thank you so much. One of the most fun walks I ever had in downtown was when I first met Matt and we were walking around and he was just in awe stopping at these buildings talking about these different architecture structures and it was really cool to see kind of all of the things that that meld together and so um, I do think there's just lots of room for lots of periods of time um, when we're looking at that. So we've talked a lot about partnerships or tax increment financing, which is how DDAs are funded. So as we get property tax growth, um, we get a portion of that to reinvest in the district. And we can use those dollars to make projects better, to make them work, um, and to make them kind of mesh in. So there's a number of things we can use them for, but when we talk about that TIF or our investments in projects, that's how we're able to do that. We call them public-private partnerships when we work on these larger scale developments. Um, it's a tool that allows the public sector to partner and collaborate with private sector company to implement certain projects in our downtown. It's widely used to keep downtowns viable. And so I'm going to ask each of our partners here to walk us through an impactful private-public partnership they did in their community. And Matt, we'll start with you again. Um, and if we could have the next slide. So th this is um, uh, one of the buildings in our river district. Uh, downtown Fort Collins is... Uh, 750 acres, and it includes our commercial zoned, uh, historic commercial zoned area and our historic industrial zoned area. And this is part of the um, industrial, former industrial area. Um, the River District was, um, was uh, 15, 16 years ago, um, had no sidewalks. It was, you know, dirt, dirt edges on the asphalt streets and the question was who, who goes first, the public sector or the private sector? And um, the public sector ended up going first. So we worked with our city to develop um, streetscape design plans and, and, and we started building the infrastructure and shortly thereafter we started seeing the, the private development occur. Um, in, in, um, it, it, it's been, a, I don't wanna say it was overnight, but it, it's been uh, fairly fast paced. Um, we now have a um, multitude of, of um, commercial buildings and residential in the district, but um, our public-private partnership, I'm, I'm gonna give an example. Um, we have an, also in this industrial uh, area, right on the edge of it, um, we have a company called uh, Woodward, Woodward Governor. Um, they're located in Loveland as well. They've been a business in, in um, Fort Collins for uh, since the 1950s, and today they're uh, an aerospace um, technology manufacturing company. Uh, every Boeing and Airbus aircraft that flies in the skies has components from Woodward in it. And um, I, in, in 2012, they, they were contemplating leaving Fort Collins because they needed to do a major expansion and wanted to build their, their global headquarters. Um, in our district was a 100-acre uh, golf course on the Poudre River, and th that uh, that project that that site became the home of their their new manufacturing facility and global headquarters. And the the community's concerns at that time uh, was that, that with, the, with the DDA we were kind of stepping out of our role of uh, participating in in the traditional classic retail historic building uh, renovations and getting involved in doing a major uh, investment in a manufacturing facility, but um, what that what that facility did was not only um, uh, provide a, a large employee base that comes into our restaurants and our after work uh, entertainment venues and, and everything on, on a daily basis, but um, it allowed us with the, the partnership that we structured with them was um, they committed to donate um, 30 acres of the 100 acre site for reshaping the floodplain along the Poudre River. So uh, the DDA paid for, um, we, we contributed uh, three million to um, shift the, the patterns of how the, the Poudre River comes out of its banks during flood stages, and it became a city natural area. Um, we relocated some high tension power lines that were running through the middle of the site and moved them to the, to the edges of the site so that they could construct their buildings. And we, we funded a significant amount of uh, street improvements along the frontage of the, of the facility. Um, the, the partnership issues were, again, is this something our DDA should be doing? Um, 
it's not the traditional sense, uh, but it t today people look at it and go, why would we have ever avoided doing that? It's, they, it, it fits into the, the context of our industrial area and, um, and the people that work there are part of the downtown business community. So it, yeah, nobody bats an eyelash at it today and, and thinks it was a bad idea. Great. Um, Sean, and we'll go the next slide. Just real quick, this is an affordable housing um, project that Matt worked on, right? Okay. Just opened two weeks ago, kind of like our spoke. Um, and then next slide. The next one? Okay, one more. <laughs> Uh, so this this is the project I, I want to talk about here. This this is just completed the the planning commission uh, process, and now that they just have to submit their building permit to to get this started. This is Fourth and Lincoln, so Fourth and 287, um, locally known as the the Heartland Cafe Corner. There was a old cafe on the corner, and also on the corner there was a building that in 2015 the facade just caved in, and if you look at it today, it has a mural on basically a plywood filler. Uh, but what makes this project uh, really exciting for us is we took three different runs at it. And maybe I'll just get up and point. And it was just this part here that we did. And we realized it had to go bigger. And what was in the way, um, which is a great opportunity, is this building, which is the, the Odd Fellows building. And when I met the Odd Fellows, they had 30 members, and average age of their board was in the 70s. The, actually, the president was actually 91 of their board. And, and they had no means to take care of this absolute gem of a historic building. And in my opinion, it has, because it was so out of code, it was an old J.C. Penney's, um, on the ground floor, the restroom height is five and a half feet. I don't even know how that was possible. I've never seen that before. I'm 6'3". And, but the, the, the brickwork, the 10 ceilings, um, is, it's, it's insane. It is one of the most beautiful historic buildings just sitting there right on our main street. So today this block is pretty dead. There's no reason to walk because all of these spaces are vacant. And then the developer bought the next historic building as well. And that was a, a food, local food company called Wild, Wild Zora. You may have had some of their, their, their products. Um, and the ground floor retail space was their locker room. So you would look in there, you'd see their employee locker room. Talking about activating 4th Street, it was not happening. But what made this project come together was the developer was able to buy and expand the footprint of the project. So it will be 93, uh, excuse me, 96 apartments, about 15,000 square feet of retail. We're gonna fill these retail spaces really quickly, I believe, because they are very transparent. They're really gonna enliven the, the ground floor experience. But the constraint was, where are these folks gonna park? You can't build this many residential units without having a place to park. So behind it was a very dysfunctional city-owned parking lot that we're putting a four and a half story parking garage on it. So it would be 277 spaces. The top 106 will be dedicated to the residential units. So we're adding, um, some better retail friendly parking. Uh, if you've been to the foundry uh, before, you've seen that on, on, on Second Street. That garage doesn't get a, enough play. I park in it every day, but, and I can literally come in and look, go to the first level. So it doesn't get a lot of use. It does on the weekends or a movie night. Um, so our DDA, we get property and sales tax. This was producing no sales tax. None of these were when we were formed. And then the Odd Fellows, being a nonprofit organization, they pay no property taxes. So it becomes pretty lucrative. So we're putting about 500,000 a year into to build, to build the parking garage. And that's still not enough to build the, the full cost of it. But we, we like, uh, I negotiated pretty hard that the city would take the, the downside of the deal. We would just put the, the increment in if it's somehow the costs go up or it doesn't perform as well they're on the hook for it, so we, we like that too. Uh, but in terms of public improvements, it's everything. We have to redo literally everything. Water, sewer, electrical, um, uh, all the streetscape, everything to make this project work. But we're real excited for it to come, and I think it's gonna really add a lot of character to our fourth street. When we brought it to city council, I'm not used to this, the community I came from in Washington, 
um, we would have very large crowds whenever a downtown item came. We had three people speak. Um, kind of made me mad. I was just wish there was more. I was like, this is it. That's the only opposition. Um, and, the, and the opposition to the project was simply the height of it. So the, this is, it, it exceeded the, the height limit for 4th Street by six feet. Um, but you'll never notice on the ground floor because of the way the setbacks work. And so um, we could live with that, adding a little bit of extra height to make this project pencil. And then what happens when you add 106, excuse me, 90, it's 96 total uh, units. You know, you can have an extra 150 people living in downtown and they got to get their hair cut. They've got to drink beer. They've got to go, and then they invite friends down and all this type of thing. So we are really in favor of adding more residential. We really think it adds a lot to the character of our downtown. So um, watch and see. There's 12,000 cars today that pass this and they've seen nothing but a rundown corner um, for about uh, 10 years. And as our, one of our developers say, this is kind of the mountain and college corner. It's a really visible corner at downtown, so we've got to get it right. So um, this is the fun stuff, I think. And so look forward to seeing this get done. Awesome, thank you. And Bianca, next slide. <clears throat> All right, so the project I'm gonna talk about is our very first redevelopment project. Um, which was the Doubletree Hotel. Um, we broke ground um, April 2016. That top picture there on the left um, is a picture of the site, which is basically an entire city block that housed the library, uh, fire station one, municipal court, and city council chambers. So again, a, an absolutely non-productive uh, tax uh, parcel, but, um, it, this is an incredible project for a number of reasons. Um, if you go back and look at all of these old um, organizational plans from back in the 80s, one of the big things that was stated over and over is that we needed a nice hotel in downtown. We needed conference center space. And actually, that site specifically was called out in a plan I found from the 1980s. Um, so, it, you know, sometimes we're slow learners. It, it takes us a little bit of time, but this was such a fantastic project. Um, I have to give huge kudos to uh, Becky Safrick, who is the, the city's assistant city manager, um, because you can imagine there was a lot of moving parts here to clear the site. We had to move a fire station, municipal court, um, you know, the library, all of these different um, very important uses, and she was just an absolute mastermind. She had a, it almost looked like some type of game board that, you know, moving pegs and, and parts just to try and figure it all out. But um, so this ended up being a three-way kind of partnership, public-private partnership, where we came alongside with the city. Um, the city put out the RFP since they were the landowner and said, hey, we need to have um, a nice hotel downtown. We currently have one hotel, which is a Clarion Hotel, um, and it is certainly not a property that we're incredibly proud of, unfortunately. Um, but we, we recognize the need. Um, also, our proximity to Island Grove and the Civic Center, we have a lot of visitors, and they were all leaving our district um, for lodging. So this was a great opportunity. Um, it is six stories, 147 rooms. Um, the, the really unique thing about this project, too, is when the city put out the RFP, there were two responses. One was an out-of-state development group, and the other was a group of 13 local investors who just said, we need to get this done. And this is a mix of, you know, the Dick, Dick Monforts and Bob Toynton's and, you know, just people in our community who um, had a heart and a vision for, um, for downtown and what this property and project could mean. So it's incredibly significant um, to our district. Um, it's been fantastic to have the additional um, visitors in our downtown and also to have that conference center space. So we at the DDA were able to put up a million dollars up front um, toward the parking. The parking is all behind the building. Um, and then also commit TIF for an ongoing um, period of time until 2033 um, for the public improvements. The city also um, upfronted um, some of those costs as well. Um, so it was kind of this three-way agreement. To me, the huge, huge win on public-private partnerships is our ability to maximize 
resources. It's so smart. Um, we can only do so much. We're a small DDA with a very small budget. If we tried to do a project, um, it wouldn't be significant. Um, but when we can pool our resources with the city and then with our private partners, um, really fantastic projects get done. So um, this was really the start of our redevelopment cycle. And, and since then, we've had um, the Maddie Apartments built. Um, we've got the 55 resort apartments done. Um, a couple projects in the work, and so it's really been this great opportunity to catalyze uh, redevelopment and growth in our downtown. Awesome. We have one more quick question for each of our panelists, and then we'll open it up to questions for you. And I'm going to say two minutes or less, because I know this is a topic we can all talk about forever. All of us um, have our downtowns on a state highway in one way or another, and there are different challenges and triumphs um, by trying to navigate a pedestrian-friendly um, environment and everything. So I'm going to start with Sean, and um, any uh, discussion, next slide, on doing business on a state highway. Well, one of the things that we were told uh, very quickly when I started was that the CDOT would never work with us on these things. And of course, our folks said, well, we've been to Fort Collins, we've been to, to Longmont. There's some mid-block pedestrian crossings and different things. So uh, we, we opened up a quick conversation with them and they were open to, to new ideas. And that's been really um, uh, exciting to us. Uh, what is not exciting to us is that we ha we're going to have to design all these improvements. The, the city is, has got other projects they want to work on, and it isn't necessarily open yet to doing some of these pedestrian crossings. But the first project we're working on, we let the contract out. We're designing it right now. is just a third in Lincoln and third in Cleveland. We're going to narrow the lanes on both of those. We're going to do bulb outs to make it much more accessible. Um, to, to to make it for, for pedestrians. But how do we do this? It was, uh, I call it a greatest hits video. We set up some cameras. And so the CDOT, you would think that they would want to see a certain amount of numbers of crossings. We actually wanted to show people video of how people were and how dangerous it was. And once they saw that, they were like, yeah, we've got to do this. Someone is going to get hit and killed. So we found them really open to deal with. Uh, and I think that's a fairly new, from what I understand, that's a fairly new um, thing. They have programs now, CDOT actually has programs for pedestrian type projects where they are awarding grants. So it is a nice change. Uh, I think you'll see a lot of changes in Loveland. We're a little bit behind the, the curve from, from these folks uh, from both Longmont and Fort Collins on 287. But it is probably the number one thing that is brought up is how we want to narrow, we want to calm some traffic, and we want to make the pedestrian the focus of both Lincoln and Cleveland. So. Great job. Okay, Matt, next slide. So, uh, we're okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, like I mentioned, Eighth Avenue, which is the main corridor into Greeley and downtown, is uh, State Highway 85. Um, so it has been somewhat of a challenge. We haven't had too many instances. We actually did a wayfinding project. So a cool piece of that is, like Sean mentioned, they are doing a lot of grants. So we were actually awarded um, a CDOT revitalizing Main Street grant for $96,000. So we worked on some wayfinding, um, some monuments to really create a sense of place in our downtown. So that was great. Um, it was a little bit more challenging as we went through the permitting process. You know, we've always heard it from the, the private sector um, and we got to experience firsthand and, and it was definitely uh, challenging. But I will say um, when we found kind of the right folks to work with and really were able to start cast, casting that vision with them, um, it was really incredible to see just that, that willingness. Um, I will say an asterisk though, um, our, our city is currently in the process of trying to gain local control uh, back of 8th Avenue and also 10th Street. Um, and really the reason being is we have these additional outlets. We have um, Business 85 and then regular 85 and same thing with 30, Highway 34. We have Business 10th Street. Um, so again, you know, for, for two different um, modes of transportation of moving people quickly, we want the opposite. We want people to slow down. We want um, cyclists, we want pedestrians to feel safe. 
Um, and I think we can do that a lot um, more efficiently, at least our city can, um, just with the resources and that vision for 8th Avenue. And obviously CDOT is glad about um, turning that cost over uh, to local government as well. So, um, but they've been really good partners um, and really receptive also to um, pursuing that uh, for the future. So we'll see more to come on that. And Matt, and last slide. So having a state highway, federal highway in your downtown, it's a blessing and a curse, right? How do you want to fill your bathtub? With a drinking straw or the, or the bathtub filler spigot? Um, so if you've got the state highway and the, and the federal highway, it, 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 it's a conduit for bringing lots of people in. So that's the great thing. How do you then balance the, the fact that you want to make it the most pedestrian friendly environment um, that you can? Um, Fort Collins, we do that a couple of different ways. We have at a regulatory level, uh, we refer to, uh, we have designated pedestrian priority zones. We have two of those areas in our community. One of them is our downtown, and the other is some of the commercial areas around the Colorado State University campus. And that basically says, we're gonna, um, at our crosswalks, we're going to give priority um, uh, to pedestrians to be able to activate their, their crosswalks or we time them so that uh, there's actually a really long period of time for pedestrians to be able to cross cross the main intersections. Uh, we do it um, also uh, with dismount zones for bicycles. Um, you know, we, we view that it doesn't matter how you arrive, what mode of transportation you arrive in downtown Fort Collins on, whether bus, bike, automobile, skateboard, scooter, whatever, at some point you have to become a pedestrian. Everybody must get off. So we don't, you know, we, we designate those dismount zones so everybody becomes a pedestrian. Then at the fine grain level, we support um, uh, a lot of sidewalk uh, cafes and dining opportunities uh, and that happens on the, the U.S. Highway. It's a, uh, uh, College Avenue has, has a huge uh, number of restaurants with outdoor dining and, and then at the finer grain, even more, we we invest anywhere between three hundred fifty thousand to four hundred thousand dollars a year in partnership with the city um, for annual flower displays. So as you're walking around, you're surrounded by these wonderful, beautiful flower displays. Nice budget. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for telling us a little bit about your downtowns. I'm going to have Chris come out. Now, we'd like to hear from you. Questions that you have, comments, anything that you'd like to um, talk about. It is a discussion more than just one-sided, so. Thank you. A great presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm wondering how your conversations about the future of our downtowns intersect with more holistic thinking around issues like homelessness, um, affordable housing, equity, sustainability, and climate change. Kind of opening up to big picture thinking and are people addressing downtowns from that systemic holistic approach or are we kind of targeting practical short-term solutions. Thank you. So homelessness has probably been one of the uh, number one challenges for downtown Fort Collins in the last uh, decade. Um, but during that, 10-year period, we've we've learned that it's you know, we we have we have two um, uh, permanent uh, homeless shelters in our downtown, um, and uh, they have been there for many many decades. And we also typically are home to the seasonal overflow shelter. So the the challenges that come with managing that really are just another management issue. Um, but we've. We learned that it, we have a lot more in common with the uh, shelter operators um, than we do um, than we we ever thought we we did. Um, you know, the challenge becomes how do you manage that issue uh, in the public spaces? And we found that um, if we take a page from the shelter operators, you know, they have a an expectation for uh, behavior and decorum in their facilities that uh, they encourage us to. Um, ask the city to um, 
um, enforce or maintain on the public sidewalks and spaces. Um, and the way that we tr um, uh, help to facilitate that is we established in partnership with the city and um, our, our, uh, some of our, our social service agencies, some of our philanthropic organizations, um, we've, we've established a street outreach program. And their, their customers are the downtown businesses, the um, people experiencing homelessness, police, the, the police department, and, and general patrons and customers of the downtown. They serve all of that, uh, all of those, that, that constituency, and their role is to um, basically um, maintain a, a safe environment, um, behavior, a good behavior environment in the downtown. Affordable housing, and I'll, I'll stop with this one, but affordable housing, we've, we have realized that uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face today is for our, our downtown businesses um, to be able to um, employ people that live in the community and not have to have them, you know, driving in 30, 45 minutes from more affordable uh, communities. Um, so we have taken um, a, 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 an approach to actually funding affordable housing with our local housing authority. And one of the projects that was on the slides was a, a 79 unit project that just opened two weeks ago. And we contributed uh, about $9.8 million to that project in the form of land contribution and cash contribution. Yeah, the, what I would just add to that is is absolute community partnership, right? So our city just hired um, Juliana Kitten, who is the director of, um, she oversees homeless, homelessness and housing and, and serves as an assistant city manager. Um, and really it's about convening all of the stakeholders. So we have a cold weather shelter and a housing navigation um, center just a couple blocks outside of our district. We have a number of low income um, housing projects in our downtown, a couple geared toward um, the elderly. Um, and then a, a couple, actually one um, recent project that's, that's a potential in the works. So I, I think so much of it is about coordination. United Way of Well County, just their office is a couple doors down and so we work with them and they have a small street outreach team, but we've recognized that it's insufficient, it's not enough. Um, so actually the city is going after some grant funds to actually support um, a team. But part of that is actually having resources to offer people. It's one thing to have a street outreach team. It's another thing to actually be able to offer some kind of pathway to housing. And so that's been a big emphasis. So um, I, I, I will say we are definitely behind the curve. Um, I, I loved getting to visit um, in Fort Collins with their street outreach team um, last year and learning a little bit about their efforts, which is pretty remarkable. Um, on the just general sustainability, um, again, I, I think about downtowns as a whole. I feel like we're um, just even our emphasis on redevelopment and using kind of the existing st structures and infrastructure that exist is so much more, um, I think in my mind, efficient in, in environmentally um, wise, as opposed to sprawling and spreading out those resources, we can actually maximize and you know, we do that through density and through redevelopment um, and these some of these brownfield sites, but it's worth it and it's more productive. Um, and then lastly, is just the emphasis, especially around transportation. We've been having a lot of conversations around just even the shared economy. We, you know, we don't have a ton of, you know, Ubers and Lyfts in Greeley. It would take you a little while to, to get an Uber or a Lyft at this point, unless it's late in the evenings. Um, but just looking at some of these newer models that really um, do help in those efforts again from a transportation and multimodal transportation so those are things that we're looking at again um, in our connectivity to the pooter trail and moving people the way that we move people um, as well so those are just a few thoughts uh, thank you for your, your question uh, I, I absolutely agree in redoing of the older buildings is a wise move we, we want more density in our downtown we feel like that is really important loved one is, is certainly sprawling right now and um, I think a lot of Northern Colorado is, and so that there's a, there's a lot of issues with that. And it, we are pr promoting how can we make ourselves more dense in, in our downtown. We are we have a major homeless challenge in front of us right now, and and some of it is we are in experimental mode. Uh, 
that we had a lot of folks that through COVID that were in the Big Thompson River area and really established themselves. And when I say established themselves, some folks were digging three or four feet deep down below. They had solar power. They were really building themselves into that environment. And we were very much afraid of the fires that could start and all the things that you saw um, that could happen in, in, in that area. So we've removed those camps and we're putting people in, in hotels. And so that's bringing these problems really quickly to places that, that didn't have them uh, in the past. Our infrastructure is, is very old. I, when we just took down Christmas lights, in, in Loveland we turned them red and white for Valentine's Day so we get a little more mileage out of them. But the main thing that people tell us when we take them down is all of a sudden we, we lost all the light in downtown. So when we haven't updated our infrastructure, we're fighting a major perceptions problem too of how do people feel comfortable in certain spaces in downtown. So that's something that we, it's gonna take us a lot of time. And we are, like I said, we're working on redoing all of 5th Street, or excuse me, 4th Street, uh, and that's gonna take two years to do that. So to really update all the lighting and make people comfortable is gonna take a number of years to do it. Uh, so we're quite worried about it actually because we are, we used to have our 15 or 20 homeless folks, we knew them, the police knew them on a first name basis. Now we're seeing people we don't know. We don't know where they're coming from fully and that's really worrisome to us. Because there are business rights too, so we really think about that too. There's a lot of people that are, have their, their livelihoods tied to it. And so we are working and we are asking our police for better police foot patrols to help make people feel more comfortable. So. It, it is a challenge to us. The last thing I will tell you is that through our TIF grants, we look to do any energy efficiencies. We will fund those energy efficiencies through windows, HVAC systems, anything we can to make our older buildings uh, become more modern by doing that as well. So, And then I guess one last thing is we also, in terms of equity, um, we want to make our rents reasonable. So we are open and to working with developers that we will put more money into it if they will agree to keep the rents in the 18 to $20 a foot range, um, which is, um, the town I came from was like 12 to 15. Uh, so um, we're cheap. I don't, I don't know what your average rents are, but we are trying to also make it as approachable as possible so a small business can get started too. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for coming to Longmont. And I will say over the past two months, I have been in all three of your downtowns and I like them very much. Um, my question actually is for Kimberly. Could you talk a little bit about what the plans are for our rail station at first in Maine between the LDDA and the city? Thank you. So I can touch on it just a tiny bit. Um, they are acquiring the land um, to be able to build the bus rapid transit station. And so hoping to start on that um, 2024 and have it ready 2025. Um, and bus rapid transit will um, go out of there through RTD. Um, and then there's no timeline for any rail, if that was your question. So the LDDA is not in that area. It's the um, Urban Renewal Authority, which is um, a, another entity that's run by the city. Um, Tony Chacon is the one that's running that project. So I can get you his name, and maybe we could hook up and get some of those answers from him. Mm -hmm. This is a greedy question. Just greedy, please. I'd like to know what experience the Doubletree Hotel has had in a running vacancy rate or occupancy, either way you want to talk about it. Thank you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the pandemic months notwithstanding, um, they've fared really, really well. I think where they've struggled, I, I'd say, I, I think the last one I talked to their GM, they were running low 90s. Um, obviously, it'll it'll flex in northern Colorado. Actually, um, one of my, my staff members sits on the Visit Greeley board, and the occupancy rates in the region are incredibly high. 
Um, and so I think sometimes even, you know, with, with I think about Loveland near I-25 where you have the embassy suites um, and some of these other facilities that are being built out that are bringing huge tourism groups like in Windsor, for example, their big sports facility complex. Um, you know, we're getting inquiries of folks who are staying in Greeley. It's also a, a dog-friendly property. And so it's just, it's interesting and unique, some of those things, but um, it's had incredibly great um, occupancy. The struggle, I'd, I'd say the slower part to rebound since the pandemic has been on the conference center side. Um, but that said, already they've started to fill up. Um, they've got some new folks in place and, and that's already kind of picking up pace. I couldn't tell you exactly, um, you know, their, their rental kind of, you know, rates and occupancy at this point, but on the hotel side, um, it's, it's been really great. Uh, and honestly, the, the crazy thing is they are the ones asking us like, oh, we'd love to see another hotel downtown. Um, you know, so I think it is that recognition that when we actually can have a, a few great hotels, we can actually start attracting a little bit more um, of those conferences, of those um, different type of events, um, and actually it's very complimentary. So, um, you know, if any of you are hotel developers, uh, we'd love a second one, but it really has been positive. Yeah, it's, it's not true, at least it's not true in northern Colorado. Um, we'd be happy to share um, our, the, the figures that we receive from Visit Greeley, but um, it's incredibly high. Yes, yeah. there you go, okay. Well, well absolutely. Hello, I'm Don Rogers from Longmont, and I have a question for all of you, really. As you're redeveloping your cities, and I've been in all your cities, very nice. Uh, they're all on the up and coming, and long mind more familiar with them, of course, because I live here. But what groups do you work with in terms of having activities for, for downtown, whether it be festivals or whether it be places to, to go for recreation or for the arts? Well, what, what efforts are, do you have personally? And, and I know we have a lot in Longmont, but what are you people doing in your positions and with your boards to work with things to bring people downtown? Excellent question. So, you know, for us, we have truly found events to be an economic driver. Um, our event, our downtown was fairly quiet and we used to put on just a couple, you know, we had four Friday Fests during the summer. And like I mentioned in 2011, when we took advantage of the common consumption, we really expanded Friday Fest to every single Friday. Um, and we see crowds of a couple thousand people every single Friday night, and that has been huge. Um, we also program a Blarney on the Block, which is actually this Saturday for our St. Patrick's Day Festival. Um, Oktoberfest is our big fundraiser actually for the DDA, so we've put that on for decades. Um, we support um, trick or treat, we do a trick or treat street. We have a holiday open house, which is our small business Saturday to support small business. Um, and we have a big parade that comes downtown. But so a lot of event programming, which is really fantastic. Obviously, events take a lot of time and energy and effort. So um, the the second piece of that too for us was how do we um, focus on businesses that really will create experience, right? So. Um, that was something at the board level we sat down and tried to identify, and it's actually been really neat. We, like I mentioned, we have a, a public ice skating facility, and we have a rec center and a civic center, and there's a lot of live music and shows there, um, but really expanding upon that. So um, since that time, we now have, we have a pinball um, arcade, we have an axe throwing bar, um, we have a nerd store where you can play board games. Um, we have an independent movie theater, the Crest Cinema. Um, so a number of venues. Um, and then what we really encouraged our other businesses to do is, hey, create things that you know will draw people. So a lot of live music, trivia nights, um, just these other events that the businesses are now starting to program themselves. So I'd say all of that is so very important um, in programming. Has your civic center been around or opened, if you will? Oh, great question. I should know the answer to that question. Um, I want to say it was in, ooh, I'd have to look back. I want to say it was the early 90s, but I could be wrong. Um, yeah, I'd have to look back. All right. So out of 
respect of everybody's time, we're going to have two more questions and one response per question. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pam Davis. I'm a resident here in Longmont. <clears throat> question for you. It strikes me that um, it's amazing to see regional DDAs come together for a conversation like this, because I can imagine a tension between competition and collaboration, right? You're all in the same business, and yet there's also a, a regional draw to each of these locations, and three of the four of us represented here essentially sh share the same Main Street between College, Lincoln, and, and Maine. So I'm curious about, among the four of you, what's, what's kind of the regional conversation around differentiation in, in downtowns? I see a lot of amazing projects that um, in some ways sort of are similar to one another. And so I'm curious, is there a conversation about, you know, how is Longmont's future differentiated from Greeley, from Fort Collins, so that you all sort of attract a specific interest and yet also support one another in the overall economic vitality of the Front Range? Well, one of the things that's interesting is we, we do have developers doing projects in both, in you know, some of our communities, and and, and uh, we don't, our, our board and, and, I mean, I hang out in all of these districts, and, 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 and I really enjoy that opportunity. It adds to my quality of life, but we, we really are focused on just trying to make us unique, and so there... I think when I started there, there was all this conversation of, well, we don't want to be old town. It was like, well, we're not going to be. We're, it's like impossible. We, we have a much different layout. We have, a different, we have different buildings. And so we were just really trying to capitalize on, on making, re redoing our buildings, doing events that feel true to us, always featuring our, our, our local and small businesses. And I just think that's the way to do it. But we're not really having this conversation like, I don't feel any competition from any of these downtowns at all. If anything, we're starting to draw some of Matt's people because they, the thing that we do here is that, that downtown Loveland feels like what old, old Town was back in the 90s or something like that. But, um, but we're just trying to be unique. We're trying to be us. And so that's just keeping our eyes on you know, what, we, what we feel like our assets are. So um, I don't know. I don't feel any competition at all. All right, our final question of the evening. It's going to be the best question, right? <laughs> well, I thought of one, just kind of a fun question. All four of you have a very unique position, and I think probably because you have a passion for cities, and um, everybody has, you know, it's something that they're passionate about. They uh, have like a favorite or a hero. So my question is to all four of you is, is there a city like that you are very inspired by? It um, doesn't have to be in the state. Uh, just some, somewhere have you been, and for some reason you really like that city, and uh, it just has inspired you. This is my question. Um, I, I had the great opportunity when I was in high school. My, my father was a um, member of the U.S. Air Force, and I lived uh, all four years of high school right outside of London in the U.K., and that was my um, stomping ground. And I love that city because it is... Um, it represents, as I started off the comments tonight, it represents the past, the present, and the future. And they figured out how to do it really well. And um, they, they pay attention to the big picture, but they also pay attention to the finest grain detail when they're, uh, when they're uh, designing that city. Um, I would say San Antonio, which is fun actually, I'm headed there on, on Friday. It's kind of an odd story, though. We we went with friends to Austin, of course. Austin's so cool, so hip. It's like the Fort Collins of, you know, the the cool cities. And and we went, and it was so great. And then we said, hey, you know what? Let's just drive down to San Antonio. So we did, and of course we stopped at Bucky's on the way, um, which we're counting down the days here in Colorado for the the Bucky's arrival. But 
Um, it was so surprising to me because the, the history, the character, obviously the river walk was, you know, wonderful, but we came upon the coolest redevelopment project I have experienced to date, and it's, it's called the Pearl Brewery. Back in the eight, 1800s, it was a, a brewery, and now it's this incredible redevelopment project. There's a hotel, there's some retail, this open kind of grassy area. Um, a really, really fantastic redevelopment project, which now connects to the river um, corridor as well. And I, I just love the story, and I likened it to, to Greeley as well, because it, it was unexpected to me. We didn't come there for San Antonio. We came there for Austin, and yet we fell in love with San Antonio. And that's kind of my story with Greeley. I, I came to Greeley for school and thought, I am not staying here. I'm going to a big city. I love culture. I love big places. And yet I fell in love with it. It's really remarkable. The people are wonderful um, and so much to, to celebrate um, as well. So, yeah, I would say Missoula, that's, uh, that's where I started doing this work. Uh, it still has its own old, old funky dive bars, and, but it also has modern new dining. They've used tax increment to create and restore a lot of old buildings, but also kept a lot of their legendary businesses, they're all there and they're thriving as well. But they've added things such as the hotel in downtown. They've converted some of their old funky drive, kind of these old 50s and 60s, into unique either new hotels that, are, that are, have a lot of character. But I just think they've really kept that feel um, that was unique to them. And, it, and so in some ways it's changed a lot in 25 years, but if you had been there in 25 years and had some memories, you would still see all of that. So it is a really special place in terms of sense of place. And um, just wish I could find a way. I wish, I wish the winters weren't so cold there. I would consider doing it, working there one day. So. So mine would be San Diego. I think San Diego is fantastic. Talk about a compact urban form. You literally fly right into downtown. You can get an Uber and then you can walk from district to district to district. And what I love about San Diego is its character changes as you're walking down the street or you're in a different zone. I love to go to Little Italy. That's my favorite. That's my jam. Um, you know, and I just think it's just an amazing, it's an amazing exercise in, in how, they, how they've done it. The one thing that I would just leave you with is we're talking about how you grow a downtown and how you remain its character. I came here from Akron, Ohio. It was a town of 200 and some thousand people. We spent every day begging people not to leave, trying to glue their feet to the ground, trying not to have them leave. That was, as they said, the largest small town in the world. Anywhere is the largest small town in the world because it's about the people. It's about how you feel when you're there as, more, as much more than it is about the size. So I've come here, and um, since I've been here, everyone's like, I'm the last man in. That is it. You know what I mean? And so there are two different problems, and um, they're just kind of two different challenges. But again, I believe that a lot of the character of your sense of place is what you make it. It's the people, it's the conversation, and it's how you feel when you're there. Um, so I just want to thank all of you for coming so much, and I hope you enjoy your days, and I hope we can uh, continue the conversation. Thank you to the theater as well um, for hosting us. <laughs>